Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see all of you. Special welcome to those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So this is a picture of a guy named Bernard Pra. He is a French artist who has a very unique style of art. When he started his artistic career, he started as a painter, but somewhere along the way, he dropped paints and he went to objects. Meaning instead of painting with classic paint and brush, he started to gather different objects to create portraits. And so what you see in this picture um, is a portrait of what he did. It's a portrait of Salvador Dali, who is a famous Spanish uh, surrealist painter from the 20th century. And in this portrait, you can see all of these different random objects. Like if you look at the top of his head, there's a clock that's there. Down on the bottom, there's a grand piano. Right to the left of the piano, there's a tiger's head. And coming out of the tiger's mouth is a fish. I don't know why, but a fish is there. And then if you notice in the middle, the nose of Dolly is actually a shark. And so as you start to see all these different things in the portrait, you're like, oh yeah, I can point out this, I can make out this. But somehow when you take a step back and you look at the piece as a whole, all those different objects just kind of disappear and you see this portrait. Now what's unique about his work isn't just that he has all of these objects that he uses, but there's also depth and dimension to his work. But when you stand at a certain vantage point and you look at it straight on, that depth and that dimension goes away, but when you move to the side, you can see clearly all the different objects. But when you look at it from the side, it, it doesn't look like art, does it? It just looks like a pile of junk either laying on the floor, hung from a wall, or hung from the ceiling. But when you come around from a certain specific vantage point, it's like, whoa, look at that. And what's really neat is when you make a transition from the side to the front, you can start to see this artwork come to life. So we have a video. This is a video of another installation that he did of another piece. If we go ahead and show that video, you can see from the get-go, there's all these random objects. There's a guitar a bottle of cleaning solution, there's a, you know, caution, wet floor sign, and then as you start to move further down, you see toys, and you'll start to see some bowls, uh, some, some kids' toys, some utensils, there's a sandal in there somewhere, and when you get to the front of it and look at the right vantage point, what you see is this replica of a famous Pablo Picasso painting called Dora Mar. This is his version of Dora Mar. Dora Mar was just the individual who was the subject of Pablo Picasso's piece. But the key to Bernard Pra's work is looking at it from the right vantage point. When you look at it from the right vantage point, it's this beautiful work of art. But if you look at it from the side, it just looks like a random pile of junk. And the way that John has portrayed Jesus through the scope of his gospel, in some ways, is in the exact same way. Meaning, when you see Jesus from the right vantage point, when you see Jesus for who he is, when you see him as though he is revealed in the way that God intended him to be revealed, he is a beautiful work of art. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel's story. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. And John is portraying him that way. So when he turns water into wine at a wedding celebration in chapter 2, he's trying to show that Jesus is the true bridegroom for the people of God that they have been waiting for their entire life. And then at the end of chapter 2, when he goes into the temple and he turns over the money changers' tables, he's trying to communicate is that not only is he the true bridegroom, he is also the true temple. He is the place where God's presence is and God's glory dwells. When he says, hey, I am living water, come to me and you will never be thirsty again, John's trying to show that Jesus is the true water from the rock that the people drank from while they wandered in the, in, in the desert. When he, changes, when he feeds 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread, he's trying to show that he is the true manna, he is the true bread come from heaven to give life and provision to the entire world. Time and time again, 
Jesus is presented as the fulfillment of God's story with his people. And when you see him from the right vantage point, you can see all of those things. But when you view him from the wrong vantage point, Jesus is viewed as an agitator, somebody who's just disruptive, somebody who's a nuisance, somebody who's a threat, somebody we just need to get rid of because he's continually making our life more difficult. And so the basic question of John's gospel is, are you able to see Jesus from the right vantage point? Are you able to see Jesus for who he truly is? Are you able to see him in the way that John presents him as the fulfillment of God's story? Now, chapter 12 is a transition point in John's gospel. Because chapter 12, Jesus makes his last public appearance before he will go to the cross and be executed publicly by the hands of of the Romans. As you ch- cross into chapter 13, for chapter 13 to 17, he's in a private meal with his disciples, a private dinner with his disciples, teaching them about what's to come in the next few days and how to navigate those moments. But before Jesus has this dinner with his disciples, the question that John is trying to drive the readers of his gospel to is, did the people In Israel, while Jesus was present on earth, did they see him from the right vantage point? Did they see him for who he truly is? And what we find as we cross into our passage today is that the answer is a resounding no. They didn't. They missed it. They missed it completely. And basically what John is trying to do is not only ask that question of those who were present with Jesus when he walked the earth, but it's also a question for us, who are the readers of his gospel, is are you able to see Jesus from the right vantage point? Are you able to see him for who he is? Or have we also missed it? This is how our passage begins. This is chapter 12, starting in verse 37. We read, even after this, even after Jesus had performed so many signs, in their presence, they still would not believe in him. See, the focus of the first half of John's gospel is all of the signs that Jesus did. Jesus did seven of them. We already mentioned one of them. Jesus turned water to wine at a wedding festival. There are three points of healing where Jesus heals a young boy. He heals a lame guy laying poolside for almost his entire life, and he heals a guy who's been blind his entire life. And then from there, he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Right after that, he just walks across on water across the Sea of Galilee. And then you have his capstone, his final sign, where he raises a dead guy back to life. And the intention with these signs is that they would reveal Jesus for who he truly is as the Son of God come to bring salvation to the entire world. And the hope with these signs is that they would produce more than hype about Jesus, but that they would specifically lead people to believe in him. Now, we're told in verse 37 that he did so many signs. There are places in John's gospel where John mentions that he does more than the seven that are recorded, and the hope is that these seven would give people eyes to see that Jesus is who he says he is. That they would be able to see clearly, because as we say in our culture, seeing is what? Believing. Believing. You got it. Seeing is believing. Anybody used to watch David Letterman? Yeah, the late late show, talk show host. He was uh, famous for like his top 10 list. That was one bit that he did. Another bit that he did was something called stupid human tricks. Anybody remember stupid human tricks? He would have people who would come on and do these like bogus things just for a laugh. Like there was one guy who could stop a ceiling fan with his tongue and he did it on live television. Just like put his tongue up, stops the ceiling fan. One guy would cannonball into a carton of milk which was pretty, him, pretty much just him jumping on a carton of milk and then exploding and him getting milk all over himself. 
right? People do these stupid human tricks just to get on TV. And one lady showed up saying that she could shoot a bow and arrow with her feet. And not only that, but she would do it while balancing on her hands. She kind of folded herself over. We have a picture of it. And then David Letterman would stand at a distance and she would shoot an arrow at this target that he's holding in front of his face. Now, it was a, a, a sticky arrow, just in case she missed. But sure enough, she did it. Now, if I were to tell you that there's a lady who can do this, you'd be like, nah, that's crazy. To stand on your hands, to bend your body over, and to shoot a bow and arrow with your feet is bonkers. But when you see it, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess that can happen. And then if I were to tell you, well, this is a thing that lots of people do. Like, you can find this all over the internet when you're supposed to be writing a sermon and you don't know what to write, so you just start Googling things. You find that people do this all over the place. Like, it's a common thing. If I were to tell you that, you'd be like, nah, it's probably just one person. But then when I show you this picture, you're like, oh, yeah. I guess a lot of people do this because seeing is believing, but apparently not with Jesus because these people have seen all of these signs but they still don't believe. And that leads to the question of why. Like, what is it that is present, preventing these people from believing? And John goes on to answer that question. And the way that he answers that question is by quoting Isaiah. This is what he says in verse 38. This was to fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So John is quoting Isaiah here, and a question that Isaiah quotes or asks Jesus in Isaiah's gospel. And the reason he's doing this is because in the same way that Isaiah was called to preach to the people, to call them back to God, Isaiah had a very similar result that Jesus did in his ministry. Isaiah's ministry wasn't so much about signs and healing, but it was about preaching to the people to call them back to God. Jesus comes to say, I'm revealing the Lord to you, and I'm revealing this so that you would come back to him and believe in him again. But both of them had a very similar result to their ministry. Now, in this quote, there are two rhetorical questions that have two implied answers. And the first question is, to whom has God revealed himself through their ministry? And the answer to that question is basically, well, everyone, like all of Israel. All of Israel has been on the receiving end of Jesus' ministry. All of Israel understood and knew who Jesus was from the standpoint of like, there's this guy traveling all over our country, doing these amazing things, teaching these wonderful things. Everybody knew who he was. The second question was, well, who has believed? The answer to that question is no one. Everyone knew, but no one believed. Now, that's kind of hyperbole. There were those who did believe, but it was disproportionate to the number of people you would think who would believe, given the nature, the scope, and the awe and wonder produced by Jesus' ministry. And so, again, he goes on to continually quote Isaiah to give the answer to why this is the case. Verse 39, for this reason, they could not believe. It wasn't that they didn't want to believe. It's that they could not believe. As Isaiah says elsewhere, he, he being God, has blinded their eyes and has hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. This is a wildly significant passage in the Bible. It is quoted in every gospel account for why the people don't believe in him. It's a quote from Isaiah 6, where Isaiah receives his call from God to go be a prophet to the people, and it's one of the things that God says to him, go do this ministry so that they cannot see, so that they cannot hear, so that they cannot understand. The reason these people don't believe, per this verse, is because God has prevented them. From believing. Specifically, it says, He has blinded them. He has blinded them, which should jolt us, in part because seeing is a major theme in John's gospel. Like very, from the very beginning, chapter one, 
The word became flesh, it says, and we have seen his glory. You finish out in chapter 1. Jesus is just living his life. Two disciples from John start to realize Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one they've been waiting for. Jesus extends an invitation to these guys. because They're like, Jesus, what are you about? And he says, come and see. Come and see. Cross over into chapter 3. He's having a private conversation with Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You get to the end of John's gospel. Jesus has been raised to life. One of his disciples named Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I see the nail marks in his hand. Seeing is a major theme, a major theme in John's gospel. So if God wants people to see, why is he preventing them from seeing? Natural question. Like, If God wants people to realize who he is, why is he preventing them? It's very confusing, a very disorienting verse and idea for people. The way that God works, the way that God engages with people, is he doesn't force himself on anybody. He doesn't force you to believe. He doesn't control you. He's not out to manipulate people to believe in him. He gives you free choice. It's one of the ways that he loves us is by giving us the freedom to choose. And God is super patient with people. I mean, the, old, the whole Old Testament, the people of God rebel, they turn away from God, they wander, they go their own way, they disobey, and God gives them another chance. And then they rebel, they go their own way, they disobey, they turn from God, and then God gives them another chance. And then they rebel, and they turn away from God, and they go their own way, and they disobey, and God gives them another chance, and 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 it just keeps going. More chances after more chances after more chances. God continually gives his people a chance. God is incredibly patient with his people. He is slow to anger, as it says in Psalm 103. He's abounding in love and grace and mercy and compassion. We read in the New Testament, same description of God. 2 Peter chapter 3. It's not that God is slow in keeping his promises. He is patient with his people, giving everyone every opportunity to turn and repent. But there comes a point when after you have gone your own way, time and time and time and time and time and time and time again, God says, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. And so it's not so much that God is closing their eyes as he's turning them over to the life that they have chosen. This is the way that God works, because he loves us, because he gives us the freedom to choose. One of the best examples of this in the scriptures is Pharaoh. Pharaoh has God's people in captivity in Egypt. He sends Moses to release those people from captivity in Egypt. Pharaoh confronts, or Moses confronts Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm going to keep them. Thank you very much. So God sends all these miraculous signs to convince Pharaoh of his power and that he should let his people go. Turns water into blood, sends gnats, flies, frogs, hail, and decimates the land. And each time one of these signs come, Pharaoh's like, well, maybe I should let these people go. It's ruining my life. But then Exodus says, but then Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart and said, nah, I'm going to hang on to them. Five times, after five plagues, each time Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then after the sixth plague, we read there's a change in the description of what's happening. And it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. He's giving Pharaoh over to the decision that he's making. After giving him chance after chance after chance after chance. Like this is the way that God works. So when you read in Romans 1, as Paul talks about the wrath of God, it's not that God is coming to smite people and send them to hell. The wrath of God is turning people over to the thing that they want. It says three times in Romans 1 that God gave them over to their desires. That God gave them over to the lusts that they were pursuing. That God gave them over to their depraved minds, not seeking truth, but seeking a lie. So when he quotes Isaiah here, he's basically quoting like, we've tried. We've tried time and time again. 
We've gone to great lengths to reveal God's love to the world, but people continually close their own eyes. So now I'm giving them over to their own decision. And there are three things, three things we see throughout John's gospel that people pursue that cause them to be blind rather than turning to God. And the first one is religion, especially the religious leaders. They are looking to the religiosity of their religious system to be the basis of their standing with God. And you see two prime examples of this in chapter 5 and in chapter 9. In both places, Jesus heals a man. Chapter 5, Jesus heals a guy who's been laying poolside, who's lame since birth and can't use his legs. In chapter 9, Jesus heals a guy who's been blind his whole life. The reason why the, the religious leaders are upset with Jesus for doing these two miracles is because they happen on the Sabbath day. They believe that the Sabbath is a day of rest, a day not to do work, a day to do nothing, and they have all these rules and regulations for how you do nothing. And then Jesus comes along and he busts up their paradigm and he starts doing something more than nothing on the Sabbath, meaning he's healing. And he says to them, you don't understand what the Sabbath is for. It's not that man was made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. What I'm doing is I'm bringing restoration to somebody. That's what the Sabbath is all about. I'm embodying what the Sabbath is supposed to be about, and you're missing the whole point. Because they're so focused on religion, and the thing that usually we pursue when we're pursuing religion is a sense of rightness. The Bible will call that righteousness. Rightness. And having this rightness, we believe, puts us in good standing with God. Now, one of the ways you know that you're pursuing religion over Jesus, the way that you're pursuing rightness over Jesus is because you live in a place of constant offense. You are regularly offended by all kinds of things because you have this system of what it means to be a good person who lives rightly in the world. And when you see other people breaking your system, it creates offense and anger in you. If you are living in a constant state of offense and anger, you might be pursuing righteousness, self-righteousness, more than Jesus. Anybody here familiar with the organization called He Gets Us? It's a social media awareness campaign, if you will, trying to highlight the person of Jesus. They put out all of these YouTube videos that simply communicate Jesus understands your life. They have little videos of trying to show how, how Jesus understands what it means to be abandoned and alone. Jesus understands what it means to be rejected and isolated from community. Like Jesus understands the anger that so overwhelms our world, not because he has that anger, but because he's tried to step into it with people to show them compassion. I think it's actually a really clever, brilliant, um, I was going to say ad campaign, but like marketing campaign, I don't know what you call it, awareness campaign of what they're doing. You can find all kinds of videos from them on YouTube. But they received criticism during the Super Bowl of this last year because they put out a commercial during the Super Bowl. Anybody remember seeing these during the Super Bowl? Does anybody know how much it costs to have a commercial in the Super Bowl? In 2024, it was somewhere, for a 30-second spot, six to seven million dollars. They didn't have just one ad in the Super Bowl. They had at least two, maybe even three, which means they spent somewhere between 14 and 21 million dollars for 90 seconds. Some of you are like, terrible use of money, right? That's the first thought in your head, right? That's religiosity working its way out because you're quick to criticize. I, I had the same reaction. I, 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 thought that, I thought the same thing. I'm like, how much good could be done in the world for 21 million dollars rather than a 90 second commercial? When we live in a place where we are quick to criticize and condemn, not knowing the full story of why they made the decision that they did, it points us to the reality that maybe self-righteousness and religiosity is guiding our life more than Jesus. So religion is one of the things that Jesus gives people over to when their eyes are blind to him because they choose religion over him. The other thing that people choose over Jesus, that he gives us over to, is consumption. 
We live in a world where consumption is constant. And oftentimes, the reason we go for consumption is for comfort. Comfort and convenience. And you see this in John chapter 6. Again, he feeds this massive crowd of people, five loaves of bread, two fish. They ate as much as they wanted. They were full. There was comfort. There was satisfaction. There was contentment. And it was convenient for them. And what do they think? Their first reaction is, let's make this guy our king. I mean, if he's going to give us free food, like, hey, why wouldn't I want to be a member of his kingdom? Comfort and convenience are the thing that they pursue, the thing that we pursue when we're going after consumption. But when we don't receive the comfort, the convenience on a lasting basis, then our usual next step is, I'm going to go find a better bargain elsewhere. I'm going to bail and go elsewhere. And that's exactly what the people do. Jesus doesn't constantly meet their convenient comfort needs. He says no to them. And they're like, thanks, but no thanks, Jesus. I'm out. Uh, We were having dinner with some people in our neighborhood this week. And there was an individual at this dinner who works for a, uh, they're a high-level marketing leader for a global company, talking about all of the work that they do for this company and marketing through trade shows and going to Vegas and how they get put up in these fancy hotels when they go to Vegas, five-star hotels that are bigger than the houses we live in. And then, uh, you know, they get wined and dined, all these free shows in Vegas and free meals and just get rolled the royal carpet out for them. And then they talked about the trade shows that they run and the booths that they have at these trade shows and how they spent more than double than what we spent on a renovation to build out a booth for the trade show. They spent more than triple, more than quadruple the amount of money that we spent on a trade show, a booth for a trade show. And I was listening to this, I'm like, holy cow. Like, talk about comfort, talk about convenience. I'm like, maybe I need to get a new job. Maybe I need to figure out how to be a high-level marketing exec to get wined and dined. Why? Because consumption sometimes rules my life. Consumption is a lure that draws me in that if I can just consume, 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 I find joy and peace and contentment. And so when consumption rules our life, it blinds us to who Jesus is and what Jesus offers. And not only is it religion, not only is it consumption, but here in our passage today, the other thing we learn that causes people to be blinded to believing in Jesus is affirmation. This is what we read verse 42. Yet at the same time, right, the paradigm or the rather the the kind of thesis statement is that many people didn't believe in verse 37, verse 42. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. Like this is the first encouraging thing we've seen in this passage. Like many people believed. But, contrast word, but because of the Pharisees, they would not acknowledge their faith. For, they, for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. Which some commentators question, well, is that true belief? If fear of what other people think drives your life more than who Jesus is, that you keep your mouth closed, is that true belief? Verse 42 or 43, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. See, in our life, like, everybody wants to be received. Everybody wants to be accepted and loved. It's a universal desire that we all have that's hardwired into us. And praise from other people is amazing. It feels so good. I was speaking at a a youth camp earlier this summer, and it was the last day of the camp. Uh, Last night, after my message, I was just standing in the back of the room chatting with kids as they left. One little boy comes up to me, shakes my hand, and he starts to talk. And he just says one simple thing. He says, you changed my life. And before he can even finish those words, like he breaks down and he sobs and he buries his head into my chest. And the only thing I could do is hug him. He pulls back. He says, thank you so much. And then he walked away. Like praise from people is amazing. That felt so good. And reminds me That, oh yeah, that's the work that I'm supposed to be doing, not chasing after comfort and convenience. But at the same time, if I'm always chasing that sort of compliment, if I'm always chasing that sort of affirmation, I will drive myself into a hole 
Because the point of life isn't to try and gain affirmation from people. It's to trust that you already have it from God. So no matter how good it feels, and maybe sometimes it does come our way, it shouldn't be the driving force. Because then what starts to happen is the thing that really drives us is fear. Because in this moment, Jesus isn't talking about just receiving compliments from people, but it's being able to stand up for what you believe, even when you know other people will disagree with you. Like, as a pastor, sometimes I'm in conversation with people. And as we talk, political things, social things start to surface in the conversation, and people just talk at me as though I agree with them. They just assume I agree with them. And I think to myself, I wonder how they would respond if I didn't. If I, if I actually told them that I don't agree with them about this political or social issue, would they cancel me and walk away and no longer want to be my friend? And because I love affirmation, because I'm naturally a people pleaser, like sometimes that fear overwhelms me. Because the thing that we're really afraid of is not having that affirmation, and we know that what it will do is it will slip us into a cycle of despair. I don't have the love that I think I deserve from the people around me, so therefore I don't know if I can live my life. See, what John is saying is that the reason people don't believe in Jesus is because they believe that being right is better than being wrong and yet still being received by God. People would rather be right about something and not be received by God than be wrong and be like, but God still loves me. People don't believe in Jesus because they believe that pursuing Jesus for what he can give them is better than actually getting him. The reason people don't believe is because they believe that the affirmation and praise from people is better than the love and affirmation they've already received from Christ. So John, all John is trying to do, all he's trying to communicate through the first half of his gospel is simply that real belief, like what it means to believe in Jesus, real belief is believing Jesus is better. That's it. It's believing that Jesus is better. Because the reality is, maybe you're right. Maybe you are right, but you're not received by God. Maybe that consumption that's driving you brings comfort, but it doesn't fully last. Maybe affirmation from people is great, but it's a rat race of which you never reach the finish line. Jesus is better better than all the things that we pursue. Because religion is about having a standing that's based on a sense of rightness. Consumption is about hoping to find lasting peace and contentment. And affirmation from people typically hinges on performance and agreement. And Jesus is better. He's better than religion because even when you're wrong, he won't condemn you. He'll die for you. Jesus is better than consumption because the joy that he brings is lasting and you have access to it even in times of suffering and sorrow. Jesus is better than human affirmation because when everybody else cancels you and turns their back on you because you disagree with them, Jesus is still with you. Always. And what Jesus is trying to do throughout all of John's gospel, through the first half, is reveal that this is who God is, that God has gone to great lengths to communicate who he is. He's given us chance after chance after chance. He has been so incredibly patient with us to reveal who I am and to invite you into a relationship with him. Verse 44, then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. Jesus is our link to God. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into this world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. John's assumption is so many people are trapped in darkness. And maybe that's you here this morning. Maybe it feels like the shadow and cloud of life is just bearing down on you. The invitation of John's gospel 
is to ditch religion, leave consumption behind. Trust that the affirmation of Jesus is better than any affirmation that you'd ever get from a person in this world and step into the light to receive what he has. And so if you're in that place where life feels dark and the darkness is closing in, Jesus is standing saying, I'm here. Come to me. Re receive the life, the eternal life, the abundant life that I have for you. And trust that it is way better than anything you could have in this world. But in order to see Jesus for who he is, sometimes we have to take that first step of faith. And sometimes that first step of faith is just admitting, just naming the life I'm living is not working. It is not bringing me into the light. It's only further trapping me in darkness. Sometimes with Jesus, we say in our culture, seeing is believing. Sometimes with Jesus, it's believing leads to seeing. It's not until we take that first step of faith that we name like, yes, I am trapped in darkness. I am trapped in a life that is not working for me. And we take that step towards Jesus into the light that we begin to see him clearly for who he truly is, the Son of God, who has come to bring life and salvation for the entire world. And so the invitation this morning is come to Jesus and trust that he is better. So may you see Jesus from the right vantage point in order to discover who he truly is. May you trust that he is better than the things that we chase after in this world. May you truly see and believe. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have communicated to us for how you have sent your Son to shine the light on our world so that we might receive the life that he has for us. Lord, I pray for those who feel like they are trapped in darkness, who feel isolated, alone, who, who keep going after all the things of this world, hoping it will bring satisfaction, even going after religion, hoping it will bring meaning and significance to their life, but it just keeps leaving them empty. I pray in this moment for them that they would come to you and that they would say, ah, this is what I've been waiting for. So Jesus, we ask because it's only through you that our eyes are open to see. Give us faith, give us courage to say yes to you, to open our eyes so that we might follow you and believe. Amen.